complexities, some issues into the future, sir, and I look forward to hearing from the Minister on the matter. Phil Twyford. Thank you, Mr Chair. I want to talk about clauses 11 and 12 uh, in part one. Um, and what they do, uh, Mr Chairman, is that they introduce um, a new function for uh, councils, regional councils and territorial authorities under the RMA, requiring uh, those bodies to ensure that there is, quote, sufficient residential and business development capacity. That's clauses 11 and 12. And the idea behind this is that um, the councils will be required to ensure that there is a pipeline of um, development-ready land um, through in the medium and longer term. And it's designed to, um, I think it's designed in the eyes of the Minister at least, to ensure that there is a sufficient quantity of development really land to um, make urban land markets more competitive. But what I want to say, uh, Mr Chairman, is that this uh, illustrates the kind of poverty of thinking behind uh, this Minister's approach to um, urban land Markets and and reform. Uh, what was that? A famine, a famine of good ideas and good policy thinking. Um, that's right. And I um, and I want to um, also in this contribution, uh, Mr. Chairman, speak to David Parker's two supplementary order papers. One of them is uh, on the um, uh, basically it, it inserts a requirement for a national policy statement on urban growth. And the second um, is about uh, introducing infrastructure bonds. And I want to explain why these two supplementary order papers must go together and why they are a far superior uh, alternative to the approach um, contained in clauses 11 and 12 of part one of the bill. So clauses 11 and 12, as I said, are designed to ensure that there's enough of a a so-called pipeline of, of available development-ready land. Uh, and, um, uh, and that approach uh, also is reflected in the Minister's national policy statement on development, urban development capacity. The, the fallacy behind the thinking is that uh, by requiring councils to provide a pipeline of, of uh, future urban land, that somehow that's going to um, uh, uh, increase the supply and therefore bring prices down. What we see in Auckland uh, shows that this approach won't work. And it's why, when the Minister published his National Policy Statement on Urban Development Capacity, Auckland Council and, in fact, all the other high-growth councils said, no problem. It's basically business as usual. It won't change what we do because, in the case of Auckland, um, it's, it's often said the council has zoned uh, land the size of Hamilton, and therefore we're fine. What are the productivity well, it's not fine um, because, as the Productivity Commission and, and other commentators have said, all that does, and under the current uh, policy settings, is drip feed bits of land progressively into what is a highly a supercharged speculative urban land market, and it makes no difference whatsoever to the cripplingly high urban land prices that are at the heart of the problem that we've got. The solution that is embodied in David Parker's um, supplementary order paper on um, a national policy statement on urban growth is to create a superabundance of development opportunities, both for people to build up uh, uh, and also for the city to grow out, in order to make room for growth. And it's only by creating that superabundance of development opportunities that in an urban land market like Auckland's, there's any possi remote possibility of actually bringing urban land uh, prices down. And what um, David Parker's supplementary order paper would do is require Nick Smith to do something that he, he could have done and should have done years ago. Instead of um, putting uh, the House through all of this and all the other expensive and, co and complicated tinkering that the Minister has um, applied to the RMA over the years. And that is to publish a national policy statement that would direct high growth councils to get rid of the urban growth boundary and replace it with more intensive spatial planning that would protect areas of special value, ecological and, and other value, that would acquire land for future infrastructure, transport and otherwise, that would set aside 
uh, public open spaces for future generations. And then allow, Mr Chairman, allow development to take place in the growth corridors as long as, and this is the big proviso, as long as the infrastructure costs, Mr Chairman, Final call. As long as the infrastructure costs of that new development can be fully carried by that development, so that the taxpayer and ratepayer are not being asked to subsidise development in places where it might be uh, expensive to develop, like far out on the fringes. And that is why um, the companion supplementary order paper on infrastructure bonds is necessary, because we need to, prov to find ways of uh, financing and allowing the provision of infrastructure to support new development, because the current system is broken. And it's not possible to get rid of the urban growth boundary and replace it with a smarter way to manage urban growth unless you crack this problem of infrastructure financing. It, it goes right to the heart of it, because uh, after all, the urban growth boundary is a proxy for, um, the, for the difference between land that is serviced by infrastructure or can be serviced by infrastructure and land that cannot. And sir, so that is why um, these two supplementary order papers uh, that I'm sure David Parker was very flattered actually that, um, that David Seymour, uh, having voted against um, these two amendments back on the 6th of September, this is the, the journals of the House of Representatives and according to the journals of the House of Representatives, uh, those two amendments uh, failed um, by one vote. A single vote, a single extra vote, would have meant that those, these two amendments that have now resurfaced as David Parker's supplementary order papers, they would have been passed into law on the night of Tuesday the 6th of September if David Seymour had voted for them. And through some strange some strange rip in the time-space continuum, those two same amendments have reappeared in the name of David Seymour on the table of this House tonight. It's very disconcerting that this kind of thing can happen. It questions my, all, all one's assumptions about the way the universe operates, but never mind about the plagiarism of David Seymour. But if he's come tonight willing to vote for David Parker's um, uh, supplementary order papers to get rid of the urban growth boundary, to replace it with a smarter way of, of delivering urban planning that protects the built environment but opens up a superabundance of development opportunities that would drive down urban land costs. Something probably, if the National Party MPs paid attention to it, they would probably want to support that. But this minister, who's, who spent the last decade blaming the RMA for expensive urban land and expensive housing, um, for some reason he doesn't support this policy. I don't know why. I don't know why. But uh, he doesn't. But Labor does. We stand for more competitive urban land markets because we know there's a better way of allowing our cities to grow. And the Productivity Commission, they advocate. They advocate more competitive urban land markets. They want to see better, more competitive ways of financing infrastructure for development. They want, to look, they want to free up the incredibly restrictive land use rules and zoning practices that are responsible for driving up the cost of housing and the cost of land. I, for the life of me, I can't really understand why Nick Smith and Bill English don't support these policies. Um, they would, if implemented, they would make a massive difference to solving the housing crisis that's given our biggest city what The Economist magazine calls the most expensive housing in the world. So I call on members tonight to support and vote for both David Parker's uh, amendments on infrastructure financing uh, and um, uh, a national, uh, requiring the Minister to publish a national policy statement uh, on urban growth, because they would fix the, the problem that's at the core of our failing uh, uh, urban growth, our, our ability to um, manage urban growth, in our, particularly in our country's biggest city, but not only, sir. They would do it in a way that's much more effective than the kind of tinkering uh, that we see in clause, clauses 11 and 12 of part one of this bill. Um, the Productivity Commission, I think, and I want to say that uh, in spite of 
uh, having uh, described them as right-wing supply-side dinosaurs many years ago. <laughs> the Productivity Commission and the work, the work that they have done in the last few years on urban growth and urban planning is um, hugely impressive. They've assembled a reform agenda that will be incredibly useful for the next Labour-led government. Mr. Chair. I call Catherine Delahunty. Kia ora, uh, koutou katoa, nā